Hey everybody, Joe here from the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. If you enjoy what we do here on the show and you think it's worth your hard-earned money, you can support the show via Patreon. Just a $1 donation gets you access to bonus episodes, our Discord, and regular episodes before everybody else. If you donate at an elevated level, you get even more bonus content. A digital copy of my book, The Hooligans of Kandahar, and a sticker from our Teespring store. Our show will always be ad-free and is totally supporter-driven. We use that money to pay our bills, buy research materials that make this show possible, and support charities like the Kurdish Red Crescent, the Flint Water Fund, and the Halo Trust. Consider joining the Legion of the Old Crow today. And now back to the show. Get another episode of the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. I'm Joe, and with me, as always, is Nick. What's up, Hanson. Nick? Great. Uh, the, our essential worker, Nick. Every day. <laughs> every, no matter what you do, uh, as, as pointless as it is, every day in uniform, you're an Somehow essential, essential. Yeah, yeah. Th- thank you for your service. <laughs> Saving lives, yeah. man. Every day. One swept motor pool at a time. Uh, so you might not know this. Uh, well, actually, before we get there, we've never been topical before in our lives. Like at, at any anniversary, I think the closest we came was recently our Napoleon series because it was like in the winter, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have attempted to remember certain historical dates to have a uh, an episode that's topical on them. We have failed every time in a, in a, over a hundred episodes now. Today is the day we pull it off. Fly the banners. <laughs> Fly, Fly them. <laughs> It's the podcast version of a participation trophy. It's like that the fucking Bart Simpson cake. At least you tried. <laughs> uh, so it, this might come as a shock to you, but I am very Armenian. I know. You do have reindeer nose syndrome. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so uh, on uh, this month is Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day. And we will not be. Is ta- it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I will not be talking about the Armenian genocide because there's other podcasts. How is this look- topical? <laughs> so, because. You're getting there. <laughs> uh, so imagine uh, you've seen Inglorious Bastards, right? Great movie. You know how Hitler gets machine gunned by Jews? Fantastic. Movie. That happened in real life for the Armenians. Really? We killed Turkish Hitler. Have you talked to Quentin Tarantino? Uh, I, me and him have differing opinions on feet, and I don't think we'd get along too well. Mm. Um, also, he's a huge piece of shit. But, uh, and this is that story. Uh, so play fucking System of a Down, cue up the Armenian yeah. National Anthem, yeah. pour yourself some Isn't coffee. Isn't that the Armenian National Anthem anyway? Yeah, it's just chop suey. <laughs> yeah. I like uh, Ariel's. Ariel's is pretty good. Uh, chop suey too. Have you ever heard the name Sogamon Tetlirian? No. He lives in your well lived in your city of L.A. Really? Yeah, and there's a monument to him there to this day. What? Yeah, he is something of an Armenian national martyr. There's Armenians in L.A. Oh man, let me tell you a little bit Where about the your fuck state. Are they at? Everywhere, <laughs> fuck. There's more Armenians in the greater L.A. area than there is in Armenia. Really? Yeah, like whenever it makes me want to go back to L.A. Whenever anybody and like mostly in Glendale, but a ton in L.A. Uh, like whenever anybody ran into me, like Detroit, they're like, shouldn't you be in California? <laughs> like, really? Yeah. Uh, like the joke is Glendale is part of greater Armenia because there's what? so many Armenians. I've there. been to Glendale. Yeah, like there's signs in Armenian and, and stuff like that. I think you guys are just hiding from society. Well, we learned our lesson. What happened last time we <laughs> stuck out. Uh, so, you know, uh, but before we get to talking about Sogamon Tetlirian and Operation Nemesis, we have to talk a, a little bit about Armenian history. Uh, because a background on a lot of this stuff is pretty important. Uh, to make a thousand year, several thousand year long, long story kind of short, the Armenian people are some of the most consistently fucked over people in human history. Their noses, like, their hair. If there was a, like a podium of fucked over people, the Jewish people are definitely number one. We're probably pulling in number two, and the Kurds are probably number three. <laughs> I don't know. Recent history, Kurds are on the podium. Uh, they're, they're definitely number one, but like historically, I mean, I might be a little bit biased because the Kurds definitely assisted in the Armenian genocide. So like, that sucks. Don't do that. Uh, but yeah, the, if there's a podium of fucked over groups of people, eh, that'd probably be it. Um, Armenian food is good though. Armenian food's fucking delicious. That's why the Turks tried to kill us all so they could steal our hummus. Bastards. Yeah. 
Uh, now, what could be feasibly be considered uh, as Armenian people and culture, or at least a collection of tribes that would become them first popped up around the Bronze Age? Pretty much ever since, and stretching all the way up until the 1990s and the fall of the Soviet Union, the Armenian people have pretty much been under one control of an em- one empire or another almost continuously throughout history. They very rarely have been able to rule themselves. And there's actually, if you consider historical Greater Armenia and the Six Vilayets, it still isn't. Uh, kind of like Northern Ireland is controlled by the by the Brits. Right. Uh, there is uh, six villages or provinces called the Six Vilayets that are still part of Turkey. And that is like our Northern Ireland, except uh, nobody cares about us. So, <laughs> no, no. Is there any sweet, like how there is Irish music? Is there any sweet Armenian Armenian music? revolutionary music? Yeah. Absolutely. Really? And it is bad. Really? Uh, I oh, mean, not I like as in good? No. I don't know if you've ever listened to any like caucus music. It's uh, you, System of a Down. Uh, so, you, you, have you remember watching Borat? Yeah. When he's like, <laughs> yeah. you never heard of Gorgi Buchek? Bing, bong, ding, ding, ding. Kind of like that. <laughs> it sounds a lot like that. Uh, uh, that might be offensive towards uh, Armenians. I- I'm Armenian. I can say it. Our music's <laughs> terrible. Our music sucks, man. Maybe it's because I was born in Michigan, but I have absolutely no appreciation for traditional Armenian music. because you weren't born in like Glendale yeah. or LA. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure there's actually, the second this uh, what episode gets published, there's going to be a convoy from Glendale to Washington to kill me. <laughs> I'll be in that convoy. <laughs> yeah. They probably rolling with System of Down because they even they're like, yeah, our music sucks, we know, but only we can say it. Yeah, I like System of Down and actually Serge Tonkin uh, did a, like a lot of like solid revolutionary work in the recent Armenian revolution, uh, bloodless revolution that happened there. So like, he's pretty cool. Uh, Kim Kardashian, go fuck herself though. Uh, not <laughs> oh, that that's on, yeah, I forgot. Not that that's on topic or anything. I just feel like I need to say that. Because this is this is the episode where I get all the Arme- all the Armenian weight off my chest and just like dog out people I don't like. Uh, Do they like acknowledge their Armenian background? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when it's convenient. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so no. So like never. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they do it from time to time. Uh, I think mostly. I, I don't. I don't know what they're trying to be, except the uh, uh, Instagram stars or something. I don't know. Uh, if that's if if I learned one thing, it's that. Um, if, if this podcast fails, I'm going to have to try to sell a sex tape and start a new career over. So I don't know how that would work. Uh, not good. Uh, I would actually go into debt. <laughs> <laughs> I would owe money. Yes. Yeah. Everybody would just like, I, I need $5 for watching that, please. I always make my the joke where, oh, I'm going to be a dancer, but I'm going to end up owing money. Well, yeah. I'm going to work on the side of the street. I'll end up you're, owing You're going to try to be an exotic dancer, so I'm just going to punch you in the face because you <laughs> yeah. offend them. Uh, now... There were there were brief spurts of independence, uh, even sometimes like their own kingdoms and dynasties that would stretch like a hundred or so years, uh, but hey, it would never really last. Uh, though being on the bridge between the east and the west, so to speak, as Armenia is, that meant Armenians got to enjoy many flavors of different invaders, like the Baskin Robbins of shitty imperialism. So the east and the west. Oh, okay. This included various Hellenistic Greek states, uh, various Persian states, Parthians, Sassanids, and Romans. Uh, and after all this, they found Jesus by becoming the first Christian state in the world in 301. So, like, cool, I guess. Uh, in, in between getting stabbed by various different sword styles, like, Jesus is cool. Why isn't he stopping this? Uh, it turned out Jesus couldn't save the Armenian people from the tides of history. Shoddy carpentry. Yeah, it, it's because he built tables with three legs. <laughs> I think there's a Kids in a Hall skit. I don't remember. Did, did you ever watch Kids in the Hall? No. So it was a Canadian... It was, Almost like a Canadian Saturday Night Live, but it was funny. Uh, and they, I think they had a skit about how Jesus was a shitty carpenter. And he's like, see, look at this table. And it had like three legs and it was just like fell, nice. falling over. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, they were eventually conquered by the Byzantines, the Muslim Caliphates, Iranians, and the Seljuk Turks. At the peak of the Ottoman Persian War, the Armenian capital of Yerevan changed, ham, uh, changed hands no less than 14 times in 200 years. Jesus. Not a lot of uh, continuity. No. I mean, the the capital is like one of the more uh, continuously inhabited places, uh, lo- like the longest continually ha- inhabited place in the world. And I have to think it's also been conquered probably the most. <laughs> not good luck. You guys are used to change. That's uh, not really. Um, it's weird that uh, Armenia, for uh, even though every single one of these empires for in their own shape way tried to destroy Armenian culture. It still exists. Like the the Russians, uh, or the the Soviets, but mostly the Russians after Stalin, really try to destroy it. Uh, Lenin allowed uh, Armenians to have their own culture and language because he was a racist, 
and he thought Armenians were an elevated race. Mm. Uh, so, like, take that one with a grain of salt. <laughs> <laughs> like, we get to keep our language for a really shitty reason. We're not going to look too hard at that. And then when Stalin took over, he believed in Russian chauvinism, which was, you know, Russian dominance of the Soviet Union. So he destroyed Armenian churches. He uh, outlawed Armenian language uh, and, and and taught Russian in schools to try to drown it it's out. Real easy to take out an Armenian house when it's made out of grape leaves. Uh, uh, excuse me, sir. I'll have you know by then they were mostly brick. <laughs> Uh, but I think your house is currently made of grape leaves. I hope so. Uh, I am a giant dolma just waiting to be eaten by the celestial gods. Uh, now, Armenia began to split in half between the east and the west when they were torn apart by imperial powers around them. Like Biggie and Tupac. E- yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the main problem between east and west Armenia isn't the fact they speak a completely different language now. It's the rap wars. <laughs> uh, something that I should point out continues to, to this day. Like, I told you about in the six providences uh the armenians controlled the western half while the iranians held on to the east uh though eventually the russian empire swooped in and kicked the iranians out taking the east for themselves in 1829 Uh, in the west the ottomans controlled the armenians uh was much of the same way as it controlled most of its subjects And, and in the way of the most successful empires throughout history it was uh if that's a concept that really truly exists they pretty much allowed the Armenians to just keep on doing their own thing. Now, solid. They were allowed to keep their or their their early ideas of national identity, culture, and language, and even their religion. Uh, though there was a law saying that no, because I mean the Ottomans were considered themselves a caliphate, so like, like yeah, you can keep your churches, but if you build any fucking new ones, we'll kill you. So I was like, ooh, okay. Uh, now that actually was largely ignored, and they got away with it for a really long time. So. Uh, they, but the Ottomans also kind of sucked at administrating an empire. Uh, the, the Armenians were Christians, and the Ottoman Empire was ruled under Islamic law. So they were, they were considered what's called dhimmi, or a non-Islamic people under the protection of Muslims. This meant as long as they paid their taxes, which were heightened because they were a religious minority, uh, the Ottoman government largely did not care what they did. Hypothetically, that was not always Sounds the like case. Sounds like the mafia. It is. It's a, Jesus. I mean, empire is nothing but a giant continent-wide fucking protection <laughs> yeah. racket. Uh, though it was far from a peaceful existence with Turks and Kurds uh, raiding and attacking Armenian villages with the government going like, hey, what can we do to stop that? <laughs> like, they didn't do, they did nothing really to protect Armenians. Uh, also, there was like, at the time, there was Janissaries, which were like uh, non-Muslim uh, children would be kidnapped effectively. It was like institutional kidnapping. And they were moved to the capital to become like elite soldiers, uh, and uh, they're effectively slaves. Mm. Is it wasn't a great system. It was eventually abolished. I can't remember the year, but because yeah, it was incredibly unpopular, uh, you know, kidnapping people's Sounds children awful. like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and then we actually talked briefly about the Janissaries uh, in our bonus episode when we ate all the rations because uh, they had their bread poisoned and like replaced with, like dirt, and a whole bunch of them got killed. Are you trying to say that we ate those biscuits that are poisoned? Uh, it's, it's the, lo- the poison is the long con, because <laughs> yeah. that episode was months ago, and we're it still was. kicking. Uh, now, they were never really considered equal uh, to the Muslim population of the, uh, of the Ottoman Empire, and that goes for all religious minorities. Um, a lot of Armenians rose to prominence within Ottoman society, however. Higher Armenian society was considered the, something of like the, the, I hate this word, but like the wonks of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, like They were nerds. They were really good at trades and banking, uh, literature, press, and art. Uh, the, unfortunately, this those are all things that are kind of considered like elite, uh, which meant they're really easy to target you as controlling society, oh. if that sounds familiar or not. Like those goddamn, quote unquote, Z- Zionists controlling Hollywood or media. The like WWE. Yeah, pre- everything. Pretty much the same, like the same... Uh, script that would be used against Jews in Germany and had been used against Jews previously pretty much everywhere was used against Armenians. Even though the vast majority of Armenians were dirt fucking poor and living at like subsistence farming. But like, because one guy happened to uh, uh, become the minister of foreign affairs, which was crazy. And he was the only Armenian to get up that high because like technically they weren't allowed to, cause he's a Christian. Uh, but like 70% uh, of Armenians were like penniless peasants. Oui. That's yeah. A lot. So like they were th- the successful entrepreneur class of Armenians was very fucking small. Were they selling shakes or something? 
uh, I think most of it was banking. Uh, mm-hmm. So the Ottoman Empire, you since they followed Islamic law, they could not have uh, loans with interest rates on them, uh, which you know technically uh, is Catholic law as well. Uh, but that's pretty much been ignored forever. Uh, that's one of the reasons why, if you remember all the way back to the uh, the, the peasants um, crusade. Uh, the the Poppers Crusade oh, episode yeah. where uh, they could not get loans because nobody wanted to give them money because they were broke as shit. So they went to Germany and got a whole bunch of loans from Jewish bankers because they're like, yeah, sure, but you have to pay us interest. Then they just killed the bankers. So like kind of the same thing. Uh, they, they had, you know, they were Christians. So like, yeah, we'll bank with whatever, like, give us fucking interest. And the, the Ottomans were more than happy to take that deal, even though it was kind of religiously illegal but like nobody is really that pious when it comes to like paying their bills. Right. Uh, so they ended up at, uh, like some of the Armenians ended up being pretty high up in the financial sector, which is never good if you're a minority in the world. <laughs> Cause it's really easy to be like, you know, we would have more money if it wasn't for these enter a group that you hate. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the problem was the Ottoman empire was largely falling apart. Uh, you know, the so-called sick man of Europe that you hear so much about around world war one. Uh, it was coming apart at the seams for generations, uh, mostly through bad governance, uh, incompetent bureaucracy, and just like no infrastructure. They never really tried to modernize whatsoever. Like uh, it, all of Europe at that point had undergone uh, an industrial revolution. All the Ottoman Empire had as well, but much later and kind of half-assed. Like there would be like the Western uh, Ottoman Empire was significantly more advanced than the East because like nah we don't really care there are Armenians out there, <laughs> but like they're forty percent of the population. Those people are like, out there. You know, non non Turkish non Muslims were you know, up to forty percent of the uh, the Ottoman population. So like they ignored almost half of the country because like fuck them, like that doesn't work well. Uh, and, and it also like a lot of places during World War One nationalism was starting to become a thing uh because you know the there in the ottoman empire was like greeks bulgarians uh, uh romanians stuff like that uh there was obviously armenians uh Azeris, georgians uh so like people were like man we should try to do this thing on our own why the fuck are we in this empire and the ottomans like whoop can't have that whoa whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah and so that's sort of like a whole lot of massacres um uh, but actually the armenians didn't really want to be independent they wanted to be equals they're like you know we're fine being in the empire it's worked out kind of okay with us but we would like to actually not be second class citizens because like we call god something That's different fair. yeah not asking a lot yeah uh is it asking a lot though oh yeah yeah <laughs> it's like uh i mean we see that now when like people just want to be treated like everybody else people are like what you're attacking my beliefs <laughs> yeah yeah i strongly believe that it's fine to wear blackface during Hall- halloween Ooh. Ooh. No, not no, don't move. do that. Not a good move. <laughs> yeah. You're not getting candy from this house. Yeah, like the like the Armenians are just like, yeah, we're, yeah this kind of like the empire kind of blows, but like we've tried to do this thing on our own and never really worked out. But like, can we just pay the same Great taxes? Currency isn't really a, going for us. So. Can we just pay the same taxes as the Muslims? Like that would be fine. They're like, no, <laughs> you're asking too much. Can we like, I don't know, vote? <laughs> uh, now. That didn't really go great, uh, and the decline in Ottoman uh, power led to lashing out uh, by the government of the empire against those religious minorities. Say like a tantrum. It was if like your tantrum killed like ten thousand people. I've never had that big of a tantrum. Yeah. Well, then the Greeks broke away, uh, like having they decided like fuck this, we're gonna we're gonna shoot some Turks, uh, and they broke away via war, and uh, so the Armenians were like, well, now's a good chance. You know, the Ottomans are getting weak. They lost to the Greeks. Like, we want to be equal. We want more power. We want a constitution. Stuff like that. So the Ottomans cracked down. And the Armenians like, fuck that, we're fighting back. Uh, right. That's when a group known as the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, a largely socialist, slightly nationalist collection of activists, uh, uh, found weapons, armed people, and trained them how to defend themselves. Uh, now... Uh, the ARF is uh, the ARF is uh, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty pretty factional like most leftist organizations, um, uh, and I'm not going to go too deep into their politics when it comes to the schisms and they've had a few of them. But in the beginning, they were largely like they wanted to be within the Ottoman Empire, but like fuck around and find out. Like we'll fight you. Yeah, we're the ARF. Yeah, we'll ARF all over you. <laughs> you ever been ARFed? 
armed with an old bolt action rifle. Uh, now the ARF also uh, conducted direct action, like raiding the Ottoman Central Bank in the middle of Constantinople, yeah, uh, because they're like, you know what? They killed a whole bunch of Armenians out east, so we're gonna kill fucking Turks in the middle of your capital. Somebody starts paying attention to us. That's the capital. Not a great idea, uh, because uh, they're like, okay, well, we're just gonna kill That's more a Armenians. Big power move. Yeah, it's a big power move. They didn't have a lot of power. Uh, they slaughtered thousands of Armenians in reprisal. Ooh, yeah. Eventually, the Sultan of the Empire fell in a revolution himself, led by the Young Turk movement. Uh, now, the Young Turks, the shitty government, not the shitty cable channel, uh, <laughs> wanted to re- I haven't heard from them lately. It's best that you don't. That's good. <laughs> Their host is a Turk uh, who was an Armenian genocide denier for a very long time. And I have strong feelings towards the Young Turks because, in essence... Would how would you feel if you were like a Jewish person and like welcome to the Eitzen Group in news? Like you wouldn't like no. that. Yeah. Welcome to the welcome to the final solution hour. Like what they he literally named a news That's channel. That's not a good hour. No, <laughs> it's not good. Na- he named a fucking gu- uh, a news channel after a genocidal dictatorship yeah. that killed a million Armenians. If not like almost 2 million. But everybody seems really fine with it. It's credible source to other people. No, it's very credible, and it, it, like it's super popular. I mean, to be fair, uh, he has like come out and kind of apologized. He doesn't completely backpedaled on it. He blamed it like you know I was you know my family's Turkish. I was educated by them. Blah blah. blah. Like go fuck yourself. Change the name of your news network, or I don't care what you say. Right. <laughs> like, it, you know that's like wearing a Nazi armband and be like, look, guys, I understand that you really don't like me here, but I'm gonna stay. And I'm not going to take off my Nazi yeah, armband. This is what I was taught. I just won't drop a hard K word. Like, mm, I'm not cool with this. No. Yeah. I mean, it's fuck that, dude. But anyway, now, at first, the Young Turk movement was kind of good. I will give them that. Uh, they wanted a constitutional monarchy with an elected parliament, which they did not have quite yet. And they supported equality among all of the empire's uh, minorities and, and Turks. Un- umbrella. Yeah, okay. and the Armenians were like, fuck yeah, and they supported the Young Turks. Uh, they even signed an agreement in 1907 in, uh, to support the Young Turks against the absolute rule of the Sultan. Um, and, you know, eventually the Young Turks succeeded, uh, and leading to elections and an overwhelming Young Turk mi- uh, majority movement uh, moved into uh, parliament. And they attempted to roll out reforms. And that went about as well as you can imagine. Uh, there was massacres in, in Hamadan against the Armenians uh, that the Young Turks had absolutely nothing to stop or punish anybody about. And then in 1913, a wing of the Young Turk movement, uh, known as the Committee of Union and Progress, just kicked out all the progressives and pretty much installed a dictatorship by force. Oh wow! Uh, but now it's important that they have a different name. But the Committee of Union and Progress was a wing of the Young Turk Party. Okay. So they're the same. Yeah. It's like... Uh, Tea partiers and the Republicans, or you know, whatever. Like, just because you call yourself different doesn't mean you you're not a part of them, right? So, well, like people come at me whenever I get pissy about the Young Turk news network. Like, well, the Young Turks didn't commit the genocide; the CUP did. Like, where the fuck do you think they came from? <laughs> like, in the first wave of Young Turk uh, elections, a Young Turk by the name of Talat Pasha, who ended up becoming the goddamn Hitler of the Armenian people, was elected as a Young Turk. Fuck you, God. <laughs> Uh, like I said, this is the, Arme- this is the, Ar- my big Armenian episode. So my, my very niche complaints get to come out. I like this Joe rant. Yeah. I can go on for so this long. This is a good them. one. Now, uh, it, it, the, the, the parliament had hypothetically had the power to stop the CUP, uh, from, uh, taking power, but the CUP is like, but we have the army and like the parliament's like, it's all yours. It's all yours. <laughs> we don't want to die. And that's they, they took over as a dictatorship after that. It was, t- it was like a triumvirate. There's three of them, uh, the three Pashas, uh, and uh, Talat Pasha was their grand vizier, which is prime minister. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, the CUP was deeply fucking racist and hated the, that Young Turk idea of equality, and it actually hated the old Ottoman Empire idea of allowing re- religious and cultural minorities to continue within the borders of the empire. They even hated that. Like the Sultan was too conservative for them. Right. Uh, okay. The Sultan was too like progressive for them. Like that, that absolute monarch fucking pussy ass leftist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they wanted the Ottoman empire to be Turkish. And if not Turkish, you better at least be Muslim. 
But they were mostly a Turk. At the least. They were a straight up Turkish nationalist movement and they made some concessions for Muslims, but it was mostly just to use them against the Christian minority. It wasn't that they liked the Circassians or the Chechens. It's like, we could probably use them against the Armenians. And that's what they did. Uh, in the early 1900s, the Russian Empire was victimizing its Muslim population. The Sar- uh, what happened to the Sarkasians is, is largely consist- or the Sarkasians is largely consist- uh, considered a genocide. Uh, and I agree with that. Um, but they forced them out of their land as an ethnic cleansing. And the, the Ottoman Empire is like, well, we're you know, the protectors of Muslims. Come on in. But you have to settle in Armenian lands. Oh, I'd take their land. There's yeah. nobody there. Uh, like, and that's like, uh, his, it had been Armenian land for, you know, forever and ever and ever. And I'm not one, to, I'm not like a borders guy. I really don't care. I'm not a nationalist, obviously. But like, there's a very specific reason why he put them there. And that's because he would use these divisions to sow the seeds of the genocide. Now, these people who had just run from the Russian Empire were running for their lives. They could only carry what's on their backs. So They're desperately poor. Right. So instead of helping them, the Ottoman Empire is like, you know, you guys be a lot better off wasn't for all these fucking Armenians. Huh. Like, you just put them there. <laughs> and that happened a lot. Uh, like they used because there's a, a lot of 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 poverty in the in the Ottoman Empire. And instead of fixing it, the CUP was pretty much like, we'd all be a lot better off. We get rid of these fucking Armenians. They're just hoarding all the wealth. It's their fault. Yeah. They control the banks. They control the media like. They're just fucking... Wonks everywhere. Yeah. Can't believe it. Just wonking all over the place. Now, in November 1914, the Ottoman Empire entered World War I and was a hilarious embarrassment for most of it uh, outside of Gallipoli. Uh, (laughs) uh, Now, they entered on the side of the Central Powers with Germany as an ally. That will become important later. Uh, Now, in December of the same year, Enver Pasha, who was the Minister of War, a man that had no traditional military training, attempted to command an Ottoman Empire to surround the Imperial Russian army outside of Sarakamish. Despite the fact it was December, the Ottomans did not bring any winter clothing whatsoever and did not prepare for this at all. It's weird how that keeps happening. Our show is just a whole thing of prepare for winter. Like... Now on to this next army that will freeze it up. And we will cover the Battle of Sarakamish in detail for an episode eventually. Okay. Because it's bad. Like, it is some of the most incompetent shit, even for World War I status. Nice. Like, Luigi Cadorna would be like, I respect that. <laughs> uh, now, the Ottomans, to, shock, to the shock of, I'm assuming only the Ottomans, they were almost entirely destroyed in the effort. Uh, the Russians annihilated them, and the ones that weren't killed in the fighting outright froze to death or starved to death. Ooh. And Veer Pasha, instead of, you know, like, hmm, I fucked up. It's like, it was the goddamn Armenians! <laughs> Those bastards! Because there was Armenians in the Imperial Russian Army. Absolutely. Because remember, they controlled a large slice of our, what we consider Armenia. Um, also, uh, th- since the massacres had begun in Armenia, uh, even though the genocide has not quite begun yet, there was wide-scale violence. So a lot of Armenians like, fuck this, I'm going to Russia. And they enlisted in, like, Armenian volunteer units Is to fight the Ottoman Empire. Yes. He your grandpa? He left, uh, great grandpa, but he left around the same time uh, after like the CUP took over and it was pretty obvious what their plan was. And there had been some wide scale violence. He told his family, like, we need to get the fuck out of here. Something bad's going to happen. We need to run to Russia because Russia would just let you in if you were Armenian. Because Z- the Tsar considered himself the protector of Christendom. So if you're like, hey, I'm a Christian, let me in. They're like, yeah, all right, whatever. And obviously, they're going to use you to fight the Ottomans, too. But, right. like, whatever. Who cares? Uh, but, yeah, my grandma's like, we need to go to Russia. And his whole family said he was overreacting. Because remember, I mean, they've been there forever. They're like, this happens from time to time. But we'll be fine. It's like the same thing of, like, when um, a, a lot of Jews in, in Europe were like, well, this will all blow over. This can't be that serious. Right. And then it was too late. So, like, my, my great-grandfather's like, fuck this. I'm going on my own. Because he wasn't married yet or anything. Uh, and he left. And... Everybody in the family died. 90 uh, members of his family were killed. Jesus. The, he was the only Kasabian to escape alive that we know of. Wow. And that's the only reason why he did. Like, his entire village was wiped from the earth. And then he ended up fighting in the Russian Imperial Army. Uh, I don't think he was at Sarakamish, uh, but he did end up fighting the Ottomans. Oh, wow. Uh, but uh, now, Enver Pasha wasn't talking about the Russian. Now, one of his plans was using the Armenians to foment an uprising in Russian Armenia, and they weren't buying it. Uh, like uh, Armenians wanted their own country, but they're like, we're not going to fucking be on that guy's side. No. 
Zar might be a huge piece of shit, but he's our piece of shit. <laughs> he's at least not going to genocide us. It's like civilization, we try to get the neighboring uh, villages to uprise. Yeah. And then uh, fucking uh, Gandhi nukes you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so he blamed the, the Armenians within the Ottoman Empire's army for his loss, that they were, pet, they were spies. He wasn't blaming the, the Armenians in the Russian Imperial Army, of which there was a ton fighting at Sarakamish, like a couple thousand. Uh, because they were, you know, they're from that area, not necessarily kind of the same looking place. So the Imperial Russian armies like deploy them. They know how to fight in the mountains. Okay. Yeah. And it worked obviously. Yeah. Uh, but he was like, no, the Armenians in the Ottoman army are spies. Uh, and he said this publicly, like it was, it was in newspapers throughout the empire that the Armenians are the reason that we just got embarrassed. It's a red flag. Yeah. That's not good. Uh, now, that's when Armenians in the uh, Ottoman Empire were disarmed, and they were sent to labor battalions, where they were used as slave labor and also executed. Oh, fuck. Uh, most of them didn't do much labor other than dig their own graves, and then they were shot. Uh, a lot of Armenians took this time to desert, though, because like, we don't like where this is going. Nope. <laughs> uh, and they ended up joining the ARF and like the uh, Armenian Independent Army and other groups that ended up pretty much becoming guerrillas in the countryside. Or running over to Russia and becoming partisans, hitting them over the border, like irregularly. Uh, but yeah, um, um, most of the labor battalions were all liquidated. Okay. Uh, and that's like uh, the the new CUP uh, standard was pretty much like the Russian or the Armenians are spies. All Armenians are spies. They were considered a fifth column of like they are controlled by the Tsar. They're an enemy within shit like that. We certainly don't hear that anymore, thankfully. None whatsoever. Yeah, as someone that grew up, and I, like as someone that grew up with a weird last name, and on nine eleven two thousand one, still happens. Let me tell you, mine isn't a weird last name, but but you're slightly brown, so like you <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Uh, so that's when on April twenty fourth, nineteen fifteen, the Armenian genocide began, and that was April twenty fourth is Remembrance Day today. Um, now. The genocide began with mass arrest, deportation, execution of Armenian intellig- uh, uh, intellectuals and community leaders within Constantinople. What came after that was a state-organized and led genocide of the Armenian people. By the time it was over, around 1.5 million Armenians were dead. As was the Ottoman Empire, because fuck you. It collapsed into a shitstorm of civil war as soon as World War I ended. Fuck. Now, knowing that their time was up, the architects of this genocide, known as the Three Pashas, Enver, Talat, and Jamal fled the uh, Ottoman Empire. Now, they all went to various different places, uh, but most of them went to Germany. Uh, These three were, in effect, the triumvirate of the empire in the last years. They escaped to Europe where they were welcomed as gentlemen, for the most part. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, Talat, significantly less than the other ones. Now, it's it's important to realize that even though uh, most people maybe have not heard of the Armenian Genocide, and obviously Turkey still denies it to this day, Pretty much everybody thought Talat Pasha was a huge piece of shit. Uh, a lot of people wanted him dead, and he knew that. And a lot of people wanted to arrest him. Uh, they like he wanted to go to the UK, and they're like, "Fuck you!" Oh yeah, dude. <laughs> uh, which is impressive. Ma- imagine being such a piece of shit that the UK is <laughs> like, is like, "No, thank at you." That time, yeah, was like, oh, "Fuck that." Dude. <laughs> Uh, the word genocide had not been invented for what they had done, but people absolutely knew what had happened during the Ar- uh, to the Armenians during the war. It was actually there's a lot of news in America about it. There's entire like charity drives trying to get Arme- food to Armenians. This is including during the rationing. Wow, uh, and that was a, had a lot to do with the work of U.S. Ambassador Henry Morgenthau. He had pretty much watched the entire thing unfold firsthand and wrote cable after cable after cable about what was going on. Uh, he didn't know what was happening, but he knew it was a fucking crime against humanity. Right. Uh, also, the Germans uh, took a hefty amount of notes about what they were witnessing uh, and probably could have stopped it. Uh, a, so when World War I started, the uh, Ottoman Empire was largely a backward shithole. They had not, I mean, they had continuously lost wars for about 100 years. Um, they had modernized with everybody else. They were not a parody with the, with the, uh, uh, the armies of Western Europe. So Germany knew, like, fuck, uh, if I have to have this piece of shit shackled to us uh, in an alliance, we have to prop them up. So they pretty much rebuilt the Ottoman army. They, at least they tried. Right. And a lot of it was under German leadership. Uh, or at least, uh, you know, they had advisors everywhere. Uh, and one German officer uh, 
said that he, you know, they, a lot of what happened with the Armenians, they were put on trains towards the Syrian desert and they would just be marched into the desert until they died. And uh, one of the things that he did is like, if any of my men take part in this forced relocation, I'll fucking shoot them. Armenian genocide didn't happen in that town. But most of the other times, the German officers are like, well, the Turks are in control of themselves, whatever. They just turned, didn't see it. Well, they're like, well, uh, a lot of them were afraid that if they told them not to, they'd get killed. Right. But like, they had the power to at least minimize it. Uh, but also they had the power to not smuggle Talat Pasha to Berlin in a submarine at the end of the war, which they did. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's how we got there. What? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, and there's a, there's a problem, though. Uh, there wasn't like a, a structure. Uh, there was no international criminal courts. You know, this is a generation before the fucking uh, Nuremberg trials. Nobody was really sure what to do. Uh, and you know, Germany may have been their allies, but the Kaiser was gone and there was the Weimar Republic now. Uh, but they still thought it was cool to like keep these guys there. Now they all lived under assumed identities. So like they probably knew that they probably shouldn't live openly, but like Germany was fine with them being there. A good thing. They never did that again. Yeah. Uh, the only country who wanted to hold them accountable was Turkey. Kind of. Uh, the problem was Turkey was going through a civil war and had been had two competing governments. Uh, one was in the west, one was in the east. Uh, the the trials were incredibly flawed, and and this is the 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 government in Constantinople wanted to hold these trials, and a lot of people thought that it was kind of a sham because they're only attempting to prosecute a couple people that were involved in the CUP as like a scalpel to cut them out of their history rather than blaming the entire Turkish nationalist movement, which it should be noted. It was the entire Turkish, Turkish national movement yeah. that should be held responsible. Uh, now that one government wanted to hold them responsible. The other one who would end up winning uh, led by a guy that is largely considered the father of modern Turkey did not. Now he, uh, to his credit, and I won't give this guy credit for much, uh, he did, his name is Kemal, uh, uh, Ata, he's known as Kemal Ataturk, the father of Turks. Uh, he did denounce uh, uh, the Armenian genocide until he didn't. Uh, once he was in power, he was like, you know what, if you were in the CUP or the Young Turks and you work for me, you're good. And that's pretty much what started modern day genocide denial. Wow. So, good job. Uh, I mean, think of this, the, the, the trials that wanted to be held in Constantinople were like if we had the Nuremberg trials after World War II, but they were ran by Nazis and they only wanted to hang like three people, but they'd still be in control. Okay. So it doesn't really work, right? Uh, I mean, you could see the problem, uh, but there's no, there's not like, there's no extradition. Like you're not going to, Germany's not going to extradite this motherfucker to Constantinople. Those things don't exist yet. Uh, and as you can imagine. This whole thing did not sit well with the men of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation. While the ARF and its members had moved into the first Armenian Republic, uh, they began to plan their revenge. At the ARF's Ninth General Congress, revenge against those who they saw responsible for the genocide was their top priority. This became known as Operation Nemesis. Uh, now, this was not, and this might shock you, uh, a, an overwhelmingly popular plan. Really? Uh, many members of the Congress, mostly from the East, who wrote out the genocide safe behind Russian lines, thought this was a bad idea because newly independent Armenia would need relations with Turkey. They still don't have relations with Turkey today in 2020. Yeah. Uh, so eventually these assholes were, were told to shut the fuck up by the ARF. And then they went on and made their operational self-assassin anyway. <laughs> Fucking Brad Pitt. Like, hey, you shut the fuck up and let us kill these people. <laughs> like, we'll turn your, these assassins on you, motherfucker. Now, it would be led by an, a man named Shahan Natali. Uh, he survived the genocide because a Greek family took him in and said, yep, he's our son. Otherwise, he would have died with the rest of his family. He'd end up uh, uh, leaving that house and burying his own father, whose body he found laying in the middle of the street. Oh, wow. Now, the primary target of the cell would be Talat Pasha, dubbed number one. It wouldn't be fair to compare Talat to Hitler. And I say that because in theory, he was not a dictator. But also, and I know like there's, the, uh, there's that joke that like it turns out you do not have to hand it to somebody, but Talat really fucking sucked at his job and made Hitler look good in comparison. Oh, wow. And like being a head of state. Because 
he wasn't in control of shit for long. Hitler at least managed to hold it together for a couple of years. <laughs> uh, now, he, he was the Grand Vizier, like I said. He was the Prime Minister. It, w- it would be... I mean, the three Pashas, you could kind of compare it to Ad- Adolf Eichmann, Reinhard Heydrich, Hermann Göring, or Heim- Heinrich Himmler, if I was to compare them to Nazis. But I think... I, mean, I try not to compare Hitler to people, because like he's just on a podium of awfulness all on its own. Right. But like, I guess you could consider Talat Pasha the Turkish Somewhere Hitler. up there, yeah. Yeah, he he's Hitler adjacent. I'll definitely say that he wasn't. I mean, Hitler killed up, up north of six million people in a genocide. Talat Pasha didn't do half that. Um, not that we're going for high scores, right? We're not. <laughs> but like, he was terrible running his military. He was terrible doing. You, know, you don't have to hint it to Hitler, but he wasn't as competent as an evil fucker as Hitler was. Is it? It's it, it's a different. Uh, if we're if, if we're gonna do a seeding of of terrible awful people, he's in the top three, but Hitler's still number one for sure. <laughs> Almost every primary source that exists uh, to the Armenian genocide, uh, per- pertaining to like orders to carry it out, came from Talat Pasha in his handwriting, or or he or telegram directly from his house. Oh wow! This included the mass deportation law known as the Takir law, uh, orders for death marches into the Syrian desert. And telegrams to military officers saying, quote, burn, destroy, and kill the Armenians. He was not even trying to hide it. Oh, this dude's a dick. Yeah. He even personally went to Henry Morgenthau, the U.S. ambassador to the empire, and demanded a full list of, our, uh, of American insurance policies held by Armenians that he had killed so that the empire could take possession of their life insurance. What? Morgenthau, who, remind, who I need to remind you, witnessed a genocide. Uh, uh, said that of this request, quote, it was one of the most astonishing things I'd ever heard, and I was rendered speechless. That's fucking crazy. I mean, and this plan is not a secret. Like, the, the Talat had hated Armenians for years, and nobody's really sure why. Like, you know, when, when, since we're comparing them to Hitler, like, a lot of people trigger uh, Hitler's intense anti-Semitism because he blamed Jewish people that were on the art school board for rejecting him. And it kind of spiraled. I mean, that's one of many things. Uh, uh, Talat doesn't have that. He wasn't a failed art student that could blame Armenians for that. He just fucking hated Armenians for reasons that nobody could ever pinpoint. I mean, rationalizing people's racism is kind of pointless. Right. But I can't find anything. <laughs> uh, I mean, he had been planning it since the, a genocide since at least 1910. And he had openly talked about his genocidal plans with European thinkers and statesmen who all, I assume, just totally forgot about it and didn't maybe, I don't know, send a warning to the Armenians, like, get the fuck out. He once literally stated in 1911, quote, if I come to power this country, I'll use all of my might to exterminate the Armenians. And people were just like, ah, this guy's just talking again. He said this to a guy named Johann Ostrup, who even included the line in in his biography from when he visited Talat, before Talat came to power. And nobody was like, that's weird. (laughs) I don't know, man. So it really shouldn't become too much of a surprise to anybody that the RF's like, this guy needs to fucking die. Uh, in doing so, they would have to give their most valuable target, their most respected gunman. And that was a guy named Sogamon Tetlirian. Sogamon had not witnessed the genocide firsthand. He, he had moved to Serbia the exact same day Gavrilo Princeps killed uh, Archduke uh, Ferdinand in Sarajevo. Oh, wow. So he's bad luck, I guess. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> He uh, when he started hearing about things that were going on uh, in Ottoman Empire, he ran across the Russian border and joined the insurgent Armenian army and fought the Turks. So he was a combat veteran, uh, but he did not serve quote unquote survive the genocide. Right. That will become important later because he will say he that he did, and uh, and it's uh, going to be uh, important why he did that. He served in the Caucasus fronts against the Turks, and when he got home, he discovered that eighty six members of his family had been killed in the genocide. The lone survivor was his 12-year-old niece that he found lost in the woods. Oh, wow. Uh, and w- he first witnessed the genocide because uh, the Russians took a city that had uh, like tens of thousands of Armenians in it. And when they showed up, there's only 22 left And that, when he was still in the army. Oh, fuck. Now, besides the fact that they had, uh, he had an obvious boiling hatred for Talat, they are, ARF also happened to use him a few other times uh, to, to make people disappear. This included killing members of the Turkish Secret Service, and according to Tetlirian's son, he even killed several Armenian collaborators. Just walking up and shot him in the street. 
dude was good at what he did. Now, uh, uh, he also had a, a a problem with seizures. Like he had epilepsy, and nobody was really sure. Now, at the time, uh, ep- epilepsy was kind of thought of as a mental illness, right? Uh, but he would, like his sons, like yeah, he'd randomly just faint. Like no, he's having a fucking seizure, you idiot. <laughs> That would be really inconvenient once he killed somebody. Oh, fuck. Yeah, like you feel like a guy with uncontrolled epilepsy would not be the greatest assassin, but he made it work. Uh, I guess he'd get out of there. Now, and all of his other hits, obviously he shot the person and then he got away. Or faint. He was was just faint like, well, that guy can't be the assassin. (laughs) He's on the ground with a gun. What is he going to do? No, so it was very obvious he was good at what he did. Uh, But this time would be different. Tet Lirian would not be dropping Talat in the middle of the night and escaping. He would shoot him in broad daylight in front of everyone and then let himself be captured. Cool I know move. Yeah, I know we, we kind of make jokes about 4D chess or whatever, but this is like some legit 4D chess. He's like, no, 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 I want to be arrested. Uh, Natali took Tetlirian aside and said, quote, you blow up the skull of, number one, of the number one nation murderer <laughs> and you don't try to flee. You just stand there, your foot on the corpse and surrender to the police who will come and handcuff and you. And demand to get arrested. I demand satisfaction! Their plan was to get their trigger man arrested, plead not guilty, and then use his time on the stand to tell the horrors of the Armenian genocide as a defense. They did not expect this to work. They just wanted it to Germany to know. Because, I mean, Germany was kind of complicit in it. Right. Uh, also, they're shielding Talat Pasha. The German public would be fed stories at front page news, and people would have no choice but to take notice. So, with this fucking insane plan in mind, Tetlerian traveled to Berlin. He got a visa as a college student and moved into an apartment with several other students. None of which had any idea what his plans were. What do you study? His landlady... The way of the gun. (laughs) What are you studying? Pink mist? Uh, (laughs) His landlady said he was a kind uh, kind man and uh, spoke very, very little German and badly. So, yeah. Perfect. Now, uh, Tetlerian began to learn the layout of Berlin and learn to better his German language skills, but also he'd attract on Talat Pasha. Talat was in fear for his life, not because he thought of a band of militant Armenians was going to come gun him down, though that was a possibility, but rather he was worried about the death sentence that he had gotten in absentia in Turkey uh, during a courts martial. So, like, he thought that uh, the Turks were going to send an assassin mm-hmm. after him, not the Armenians. Little did he know. Though he did make jokes like, let the Armenians come for me. Like the Armenian guy in the back, you wait with a bigger faker nose over his other big nose. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, like someone asked him if he ever feared that Armenian would come and shoot him, and he like considered them like lower than shit. And he's like, they probably couldn't pull it off if they tried. Oh, <laughs> suck on that motherfucker! <laughs> Taste those ball butter. F- fucking Tent Leering hitting with the Uno reverse card. <laughs> now, uh. The Talat would routinely change houses and he had several bodyguards. Like he had safe houses and he moved around uh, and he changed his appearance. He normally had a mustache, which uh, was probably, I guess, the most stereotypical like Ottoman Empire dictator mustache you've ever witnessed. And he grew it into a giant beard, making him hard to recognize. I mean, it's the 1900s. So you're not going to fucking Google him. Uh, to make matters worse, Tetlirin had no fucking idea where this guy was. Nobody had any intelligence on him except that he's in Berlin. Sweet. Which is a big fucking city. Uh, I mean... This tr- needs to be a movie. I, actually, so the main source I use for this is a book called Operation Nemesis written by Eric Bogosian. And he's a screenwriter. He's not a historian. So, like, he originally wanted to research this as a screenplay because it was such a crazy story. And then as he did it, he realized, like, holy fuck, this needs to be a book. And it's really good. Really? Yeah. It sh- I mean, it still should be a movie. But yeah, it'd be a sweet movie. Yeah, I'd, I'd watch it. And I'm going to completely unbiased a source on this. Uh, no, Tellerian had to find a place to start and he had no leads at all. Uh, he wasn't a master spy. He was a fucking assassin. Uh, like he shot people, then vanished into the middle of the night. This is a little bit outside of his skill set. Yeah, it's weird when you question people and then shoot them. <laughs> I mean, the good news was that Talat Pasha would fuck all this up for himself. Uh, you see, British intelligence was also looking for Talat Pasha. The international community didn't much care about the Turkish war crimes trials that he had been found guilty of. Uh, also, the other Pashas all sentenced to death as well in absentia. Uh, but they were looking for him for a different reason. Now, they supported the, uh, the other Turkish government in, that had passed the death sentence. Not for any like 
good reasons for British reasons. Like they thought that they could leverage them to get better trade deals. Mm. They weren't like, yes, we, yeah, we really support your form of government. Like, no, we feel like we could use you for oil rights. You stupid fuck. Right. Uh, but they thought that if they like delivered them, delivered to Pasha, maybe they'd win them some points. Um, yeah, I mean, that they, they were just wanting to leverage it. Uh, meanwhile, the opposing government that did not like the uh, trials and didn't agree with them, uh, led by Mustafa Kemal's nationalist, was decidedly anti-British and knew that, like, the Brits knew, like, if they win, we're actually going to have to treat them as a country. So, like, they didn't like that. Now, uh, British intelligence almost immediately found Talat because, like, they're actual spies and stuff. <laughs> uh, he was living in a small apartment in the Charlottenburg district on Hardenburgstrasse. I just thought he made it super easy. Yeah, this is the giant Turkish flag that's at his house. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a British agent found him and then invited him to a meeting. The agent's okay. So the agent's name was and peak. Uh, prepare for peak British names. Okay, this is his full name: Arbre, Aubrey Nigel Henry Monalu Herbert. <laughs> he also has a, a DL uh, title, which is like a ceremonial queen thing. I guess. Yeah. Uh, I like the Nigel. Now, Aubrey and Talat had met years before, and they had built up some kind of relationship, so Talat saw no reason to not have a meeting with him. Um, during the meeting... Romantic? Tal- <laughs> no. Uh, no. Now, Aubrey was a, a spy, and he wanted to kind of gauge Talat Pasha. Like what w- now, if they could use Talat Pasha in the government in Constantinople to further British means, they absolutely would have been like, yeah, we'll get you back to Turkey. Uh, but... Uh, during the meeting, and uh, Aubrey did ask him about the Armenians, uh, but he shifted blame about the Armenian genocide to literally anyone else. He blamed other members of the government. The he Ar- blamed the Armenians. He did blame the Armenians. <laughs> it was one of those like, they had it coming. <laughs> and he also bl- blamed the British. What? <laughs> <laughs> like, his whole thing was like, well, and, and like also at, at the same time, he admitted that he did it because like they fucking des- fuck them. They deserved it. It's like the weirdest thing. And this meeting is only like 20 minutes long. So, like, the whole time he's, like, flying from one end of the spectrum to the other, like, I didn't fucking commit a genocide, and if I did, fuck him! And Aubrey's like, uh-huh. Okay. okay. Now, at the same time, like, he, he didn't really care about the genocide all that much. Aubrey was trying to uh, figure out what Talat's plans were. Uh, and Talat was open that he wanted to get back involved in Turkish politics, uh, and, but he was rooting for Kemal to win. He also planned on inciting pan-Islamist movements throughout the Middle East. Now, if you're unaware, pan-Islamist thing is like, we should all form a caliphate and get rid of all these fucking Brits that are coming in. This is our land. It should be ours. Uh, and that directly affected British interests yeah. that they had just won in World War I. So they're like, hmm, this is a problem. We can't let this guy get out of here. Now, the problem is, like, if the Brits took him out, the Germans would be pretty pissed off. Like, and... and the British support, the kind of support the Weimar Republic while crushing them with reparations anyway. But uh, they didn't want to just like gun them down and then have it be very easily linked back to the British government. Yeah, because they leave stuff behind like tea. <laughs> it's a whole trail of monocles leading <laughs> to the corpse. Uh, and they didn't really have any means. Like they didn't have any like, don't worry, I got a guy. Like they didn't have a guy to like, uh, with plausible deniability between them and them. So yeah, they didn't have 007 at the time. So they reached out to the Soviet Union. Uh, who's also worried about Talat's activities uh, because the, a pan-Islamic movement would really fuck up their large Muslim minority they had within the USSR. Uh, so they're like, mm, we got to get rid of him too. And everybody wants this guy dead. <laughs> yeah. And the Soviets are like, wait a minute. We got a guy. Call the ARF. So We'll call the ARF. So the Soviet Union had taken over Armenia uh, and, and the ARF had kind of like fucked off and left because they realized they probably weren't going to be doing so great there. Uh, but I mean, the, but they were kind of sort of allies of the Soviet Union when it helped them. Not, not great, but it, it worked. Uh, but they definitely had a connection. Like if the Soviet Union would leak them some information, say, where Talat Pasha lived, they knew they'd figure out the rest. Um, and that's what he did. Uh, they're like, the Soviet Union leaked it to the ARF, and the ARF told Sogomon Tetlin, like, this is where he lives. At least it wasn't like a blanket, like, He's in Berlin. Yeah. Uh, and there's not That's a lot good. of evidence to suggest that Sogomon Tetlerian knew he was kind of being used as a proxy by the British in the USSR. Uh, but yeah, he kind of was. Fuck it. Fuck that guy. Hey, the enemy of the, my enemy of my enemy of my enemy is the guy I shoot. It's oh. a problem solved. I thought he was like, is the guy I 
kiss. <laughs> I, got, I got lost somewhere in the middle. Some weird shit happened. Uh, so Tetlerian moved across uh, the street from uh, Talat Pasha into an apartment directly across the street uh, and started uh, observing him to like figure out his plans, which ended up being really fucking easy. Um, Talat had a pretty normal daily routine. He would go on an early morning walk every single day and circle the same blocks in the neighborhood. Because apparently he's just a poor rich guy who, and TV hasn't been invented yet. Right. He couldn't just, I don't know, binge watch Tiger King or something or on get Netflix. get on Twitter. And- yeah. I have to walk around the goddamn block. So he decided it would have to be then. Uh, like he's like, well, every single day goes out about around 11 uh, and uh, or 10 or 11. And I can just like meet him on the street corner and be like, hey, Talat. And if he looks at me, I shoot him in the face. Because like he, he was practicing in the mirror like a uh, taxi driver. <laughs> Coming up with like... <laughs> coming up with a fucking one-liner. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, he probably definitely... And like at the same time, uh, the the landlady is like, yeah, he got really anxious and kept passing out. <laughs> <laughs> Just in the, by the mirror? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so he decided to have to be then and there. Uh, so he set off on 10 a.m., March 15th, 1921. You think... He would assassinate somebody faint and then wake back up like, oh, just start shooting, <laughs> start again. shooting him again. Yeah. Uh, now, as Talat went on his walk, Tetlerian headed him off, jog- jogging to the corner of the street and walking towards him. He had to be sure it was him, so he got close to double check his uh, identity. Looked real close. He still wasn't quite sure. Did he do the old Talat? Like, no, he look did. Look away, and he, then he spun around, and said Talat Pasha, and when he looked over his shoulder, Tetlerian shot him in the base of the neck, nice, dropping him. He fell on his face dead instantly. Now, as people around him began to scream because, you know, he just fired a gun off yeah, in the middle of Berlin at 10 a.m. Yeah. Uh, and, and most people haven't seen a guy get murdered in front of them. Uh, people began to scream and panic. And then Ted Leeren began to panic and quickly forgot about the plan to stand on when he get arrested. So he took off running up the street. <laughs> you think he's like, oh, fuck, wait. <laughs> he's like, I'm out of here. Fuck this. Unfortunately, the crowd took off after him. Uh, and he quickly got it surrounded and grabbed. More people joined in the crowd. They began beating the shit out of him. What the fuck? <laughs> like one person hit him with a giant heavy key ring and like gashed open his face. Other people hit him with oh, like his yeah, keys back then were like 10 pounds. Yeah. And other people like hit him with bricks. <laughs> Where'd you get that brick? I've been carrying this for so long. <laughs> yeah, like, I have questions for this crowd. Uh, he was actually a lobbyist uh, for the, uh, the, the union the, brick guy, the national brick society. The only person that stops a, Bad person with a brick is a good person with a brick. <laughs> uh, and that soon Tent Leeren realized, like, I'm not going to get arrested. I'm going to get fucking lynched. <laughs> and then he yelled out in really bad German, I'm Armenian. He's Turkish. Why do you care? And then they were like, ah, okay. No, they just can't hit him. No, okay. Finally, though, the police showed up, probably saving his life. And he got chucked in the back of a paddy wagon. I'm, I'm just imagining a shit to the things that the, the crowd probably had, like random shit. Which I can tell you from firsthand experience is the first time anyone was happy that the fucking German police showed up. Because those guys are dicks. <laughs> Why do you have a toilet brush? <laughs> <laughs> Several months later, he was uh, brought on trial for murder. Now, like the ARF had long planned, Tetlerian would make a stand. He'd plead not guilty and tell the whole story of the Armenian genocide. As his defense... Now Did you forget? No. Okay. Now, uh, because his German was... So his German was not great, but he didn't actually need a translator, but he said that he needed one. And they uh, looked around like, hmm, we don't have many people that speak Armenian and German fluently here. So they just happened to pick a translator who worked directly for the ARF in an operation nemesis. Nice. R- real smooth. Uh, and so uh, he could... He was a real smart dude, and like he was able to... Uh, uh, kind of like if Tet Liren fucked up a question, he would just translate the answer he knew the ARF wanted him to say. <laughs> I think the ARF had a handshake. Oh, definitely. Probably at the end, you definitely go, <laughs> and you explode your hand outwards. Touch noses. Real slow. <laughs> yeah, It's weird because like, a lot of them have mustaches. Ooh. Yeah. Tickling. Uh, now, on the stand, Tet Liren told long stories about the horrors that he witnessed during the Armenian Genocide about how watching the Ottoman troops kill his mother and father and literally bury him under a pile of corpses and leave him for dead. Uh, uh, none of it was true. Right. He didn't go through any of that. I remember this. Yeah. Uh, but he, like I said, he wasn't even in Armenia. Uh, but it didn't matter because his, his plan was working. Like the jury was like openly weeping. Uh, 
It is insane. His lawyer argued that Tetlerian was clearly mentally unwell due to the result of what he went through in the genocide. And what he witnessed uh, it, it caused him to act out, and he could not be responsible for his actions. He told the court that Tetlerian had horrible seizures and uncontrollable fits ever since the genocide, which is partially true, but also he'd had that his whole life. Right. Uh, and Tetlerian had never been a, 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 a diagnosed with epilepsy until doctors... Uh, sent by the court to determine if he was crazy or not, went over and uh, found out that he had epilepsy. Uh, how, did they, how, did they, how did they do that? Uh, back then, uh, they probably just looked at him until he had a seizure. Flashed lights at him? Probably. Um, now, like I said before, uh, in the day, epilepsy was considered something of a mental illness. Like, it wasn't, like, people didn't like, oh, there's something, you know, you know, something's wrong in his brain. It doesn't like make him not un- unable to think like he's clearly weak of constitution. He's right. having seizures. So like a doctor that diagnosed him, uh, said that clearly his epilepsy, uh, uh made him responsible for killing Talat Pasha. Now it was like one of five doctors who agreed on this. Everybody else like, no, he knew what he did, <laughs> but everybody promptly forgot. Now, uh, the doctor that, uh, that did, um, diagnose him was pretty convincing. Uh, and other doctors said, yes, he has epilepsy, but that won't make you kill people. Yes, but no. But like they, but they all agreed on epilepsy uh, uh, being something that he had. And the popular idea of what that meant was like, oh, he's mentally unwell. So even though they didn't agree with the fact he was mentally unwell, they kind of did. Right. Uh, but yeah. Now, the lawyers also did. Talat had a few lawyers and together they were like legal magicians because they they made the entire trial not about the fact that Tetlerian killed a guy. They made it the entire trial about how Talat Pasha was a piece of shit. Um, they they made the court kind of, they kind of forced the court to legally decide Talat's role and responsibility in the genocide, even though that is not wow. what this trial is about. <laughs> the old switcheroo. Like Armenian survivors took the stand, uh, real ones, not. Talirian, uh, Ed told her stories and one was so graphic. It was a woman who told the story of uh, horrible things that happened to her. Uh, and the jury was like crying. Uh, the, 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 the gallery was, was crying. There's a couple Turks present because like Talat Pasha was still popular in the national circle. Uh, wanted to see the trial of the man who killed Talat Pasha began like openly screaming at her, calling her a liar and had to be escorted out. Uh, like, and, and at another point, uh, his uh, attorney introduced telegrams that Talat Pasha had sent to order the genocide. And it was, and the judge actually accepted them as evidence. What? Yeah. I have no idea how. Like, that has nothing to do with this. That would be like, I mean, hypothetically, that means, like, you could go kill a war criminal. I'm not going to say which one. You could go gun down a war criminal. And then make the, like, but he killed all those people over there. And the judge is like, ah, yes, you're good. You're fine then. Like, someone's gonna go, yeah. so, if someone goes and hunts, like, William Colley from Vietnam and they're like, well, he is a huge piece of shit. So like in this situation, two wrongs do make a right. <laughs> Consider. Yeah. It's, I don't understand the, the Weimar Republic's courts, but I kind of like them. Uh, the, the lawyer managed to turn the entire court into arguing the guilt of the dead man rather, Holy than, shit. rather than the guilt of the man who shot him. And the, the prosecutors were like, no, 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 this isn't about any of this. It did not work at all. Uh, Tetlerian also had another small hurdle to jump over. Uh, if he was found guilty of premeditated murder, which he absolutely did do, right. he would be sentenced to death. So they had to prove that he did not plan this. Now, remember, during all this, they had no idea that Operation Nemesis was a, was a thing. Uh, and he had, of course, he's not said shit about it. How do you play this off? So he explained that it was a spur of the moment thing. That he was walking down the street and he was like, holy shit, it's Talat Pasha. And he could not help himself but to shoot him. Anger took over. Now, the Germans uh, brought, the German prosecution brought his landlord uh, to the stand and said uh, that he had recently traveled to Germany. He's, you know, he's obviously a very depressed individual. And oh yeah, by the way, he just happened to live across the street from Talat Pasha. Very recently. Like he moved there from another place in Germany. Now with presented with all this, their defense was like, yeah, crazy, right? Small Wins. world. I don't see this. Yeah, yeah fucking weird. This. Another small problem when uh, Tetlerian openly told the cops that arrested him that he specifically came to Germany to kill Talat Pasha. <laughs> now, uh, this is largely accepted as fact. 
But uh, Tetlerian's master defense was, I never said that, even though there was a confession. I see nothing wrong with this. Uh, now, it worked out for him, kind of accidentally, that when he was questioned by police, they wrote everything down in German. Now, Tetlerian's written German was terrible at the time, so he refused to sign his confession because he couldn't read it. So the judge pretty much looked at, Tetler- looked at the document, looked at Tetlerian, and was like, he's probably telling the truth. He probably didn't say that. <laughs> and then the confession couldn't be used in court. But telegrams from the Armenian genocide could. His power plays work. I don't understand this court, but it's awesome. awesome. I mean, I, I'm not a lawyer, and I understand very little about the criminal justice system. But I, this is a criminal justice system that could only exist in some weird version of law and order. as like uh, law and order, war crimes division. Why isn't that a show? It um, should be. This should be a movie. Yeah, it should. With great cinematography. Now, uh, Tetlerian, for his part, never once dodged the fact that, yeah, I killed that guy in broad daylight. <laughs> his defense boiled down to, yeah, I killed him, but fuck him, he deserved it. Also, I didn't plan it. Nice. And I'm not in control of my own facilities. The, the defense made no sense. Uh, Tetlerian closed out his questioning by saying, uh, when the ju- so the judge asked him, do you think you're guilty? And he says, I do not consider myself guilty because my conscience is clear. And the judge said, how could you possibly have a clear conscience? You killed a man. And he said, quote, I have killed a man, but I'm not a murderer. I'm like, all right. Sounds good. <laughs> In closing, Tetlerian's lawyers talked about literally everything other than the fact that their client definitely shot that guy in the middle of Berlin. They talked about the guilt of Talat Pasha and the crimes of the genocide. And furthermore, they tried to point out that Germany was an ally of the Ottomans. So they bear responsibility for the crimes against the Armenian oh, we're people. We're turning it around. We're turning it around. All right. And they should do everything in their power uh, towards uh, getting forgiveness uh, or earning forgiveness from the Armenian people. And said, quote, the German people cannot be thought of to condone these atrocities. A good place to start, was argued, was acquitting Tetlerian. Good thing that the German people would never do something like this of their own. Never. <laughs> the jury then excused themselves. Now, I should point out that the prosecution is, like, losing their mind at this point. They're like, what are they talking about? He killed a guy. That's what this is about. And then, <laughs> so over there banging their head on the desk. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and meanwhile, and, like, the whole time, even though, like, remember, part of the defense is, like, you know, he's obviously mentally unwell. Pet Lirian never showed a hint of fucking emotion. He was chill as fuck the whole time. Like, so, like, the prosecution is flying off the handle, unable to control their own courtroom, effectively. And he's just sitting there with, like, the meme deal with the glasses coming over his head. Hey, what are you going to do? <laughs> now, uh, the jury eventually excused themselves. Tetlerian sat down thinking he was almost certainly going to be facing a firing squad. At no point did he think he was actually going to be found not guilty or, or even like, escape a death sentence. Everything you're telling me, what it's all leading up to is... This guy's fucking getting off with this. So, like, T- Tetlerian was like, I'm definitely, like, there's no way they're going to fall for this dumb shit. Um, now, the trial lasted only two days, and the jury took only an hour to return, which is never, a go- it's never a good sign, right? Like, what, normally when you, when you read things and they're like, the jury only took 20 minutes, like, oh, that guy got the death penalty. Yeah, that guy's dead. <laughs> yeah. They came back after an hour, and the judge said, I avow with clear and honor and consciousness in the verdict of the jury. Is the defendant Sogamon Tetlirin guilty of intentionally killing a man, Talat Pasha, on March 15th, 1921 in Charlottenburg? To which the foreman of the jury, a guy named Otto Vrinke, said, quote, in accordance with the decision of the jury, we find the defendant not guilty of the punishable act of which he has been charged. What? <laughs> not guilty. This is awesome. The judge then said, like, with a, like oh, okay. <laughs> the judge said, therefore, the following sentence is issued. The defendant is to be acquitted at the expense of the state treasury, which means that he had to be paid for the time that he lost being in, in jail for the last couple months. Okay. <laughs> in accordance with the decision of the jury, the defendant is not guilty of the punishable act which he has been charged. The order of imprisonment as regards the defendant is hereby annulled. He walked away a free man. That's awesome. He, wa- he walked away a free man after killing a head of state in broad daylight in front of literally dozens of witnesses. That's awesome. <laughs> and then, like... The defense was so hilarious. Like, this is Germany's fault. If you find him guilty, Germany killed the Armenians too. And the Germans, like, fuck. <laughs> now we have to do something. We're only down with killing Jews. We can't kill this guy. <laughs> uh, now, in the end, Operation Nemesis would kill most of their targets, shooting down eight senior Ottoman Holy leaders. shit. <laughs> including all three of the Pashas. The ARF is the shit. <laughs> and another case, another guy got away with it via court in Constantinople. In Turkey, 
He got away with did it. Did you do the same thing? Yes. They He's like, I did it because that move. motherfucker deserved it. And the turkey's like, yeah, right. That's a power move. And now, this is awesome. Uh, uh, all three of these guys had gotten death penalties in Turkey. So, like, they're like, yeah, I guess you just kind of did it for us. Okay, can't find you guilty of that. Now, the, th- uh, the third one, uh, uh, another Pasha, had actually had been killed not by a member of Operation Nemesis, but by an Armenian within the Soviet military. Uh, he was in a uh, he's in Kazakhstan, I believe, and an Armenian lieutenant who was in charge of a, a cavalry detachment recognized him as one of the pashas and just ordered his unit to kill him. <laughs> How'd they do it? They just went over and fucking shot him. <laughs> even though he, even though that pasha was there, I think it was Jamal Pasha on orders of the Soviet Union, like he was working with them. Holy shit! And he's like, "Yo, fuck Lenin, let's get that motherfucker." <laughs> Now, Tetlerian went on to live a long life and eventually settled in San Francisco. Hey. Now, uh, at one point, he was in Czechoslovakia, and when the Germans invaded, he still had his Luger that he shot Talat Pasha with because the Germans had to return it. It's like, well, it's not evidence. You're not guilty. Here's your, Here you here's your gun. <laughs> and he was so terrified that the Germans would confuse him with a Jewish person and with a Luger. So, like, maybe he'd kill a German oh, to get it. Yeah. He had to chuck it in a lake. What? Yeah. Now, uh, he, uh, he became pretty disillusioned with everything, especially after living through a Nazi occupation, and he, that's when he moved to uh, San Francisco. He died in 1916, buried in Fresno, where a giant monument stands over his grave, an, a gold-plated eagle killing a snake between its talons. The snake is meant to be Talat Pasha. Nice. So I drive through <laughs> Fresno. I'm going to go through there once. Take a picture with it. I fucking will. <laughs> Now, he's been immortalized in revolutionary songs and pictures, as long as being beloved by Armenians around the world. Countless statues, busts, and monuments have been built around him around the small country of the Republic of Armenia. And I think he would best like to be remembered the way I would like to be remembered. And then has a revolutionary drinking song called Pour the Wine, which goes, quote, The Armenians' horror shook the world. The Turkish throne fell to the ground. Let me tell you about the death of Talat. Pour the wine, dear friend. Pour the wine. Drink it nicely and drink it with delight. Nice. And that is the story of the fucking vengeful uh, <laughs> goddamn sword of Armenia, t- uh, Sogamon Tetlerian. This needs to be a movie. This, this guy's awesome. Right? And, uh, you know, it should be a movie. Uh, but, you know, like I, I think I said once before that the last time I tried to make a movie about the Armenian genocide, that was fucking terrible. I still need to watch it. I, I know I need to. Uh, uh, I, I watched about. 60% of it. Especially I was like, nope, since, no more. Especially since I enjoy Christian Bale. Yeah, if if he was just like Armenian Batman, I'd watch that. Would he, Armenian Batman? Do you have Lavash? <laughs> oh, God. He was like, the, the, the criminal's like, do you smell Drakkar Noir? Time's up, motherfucker. <laughs> it, it, instead of having a bat cave, he just hangs out a cell phone, like, <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> in the mall. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't a bat cave. I couldn't afford one. <laughs> I spent it all on deep V-neck I shirts. Could, honestly, in really <laughs> shitty cologne. I could honestly imagine there's uh, he's get talking business with the ARF, and he's like, one second. And the customer's <laughs> asking about a cell phone. I have a good deal just for you, friend. <laughs> <laughs> Christian Bale, is that you? Christian Balian. <laughs> and that that is uh, the story of Sogamon Tetlerian. And that is... The most Armenian episode I'll probably ever do. This is one of the sweetest episodes this year, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been Start waiting. Started off sad. <laughs> I've been waiting so long to do this, and uh, so uh, like most people are, are aware, I, I write scripts, uh, like uh, eight to fifteen page scripts most of the time for episodes, and I was writing a completely different script, and then I realized, like, holy fuck, it's April. I can do this now, and it's perfect. Cause like I could I do a series on the Armenian genocide? Sure. Do I want to? No. Other people have done it. Uh, and, that is and it, extremely sad. Yeah, I don't think I could do a fucking eight part series about my family dying. Like I, I just don't think I could do it. So like, but I can do an hour and a half long episode about Sogamon Tetlir and shooting Talat Pasha in the fucking head. It's definitely our style. Yes. Uh, and it's been a while since we've like talked about like a, an individual, not, not a donkey. Yeah. So like. He is, uh, he's, uh, the, the, we are now the, uh, the, the Eagles killing snakes podcast. Nice. Uh, but Nick, thank you for joining me on this wonderful story of revenge. Uh, and for everybody else, we will see you next week. Can this be, can we have stickers somehow? (laughs)